It's here in Leningrad where the first rock club in the Soviet Union was created. Socialist logic puts the right to authorize public performances and the choice of songs up to a vote by a Soviet made up of members of the Young Communists, representatives of the cultural services, the unions of the city of Leningrad, and the members of certain rock groups. Created in order to channel and control the fascination of young people for this kind of music, the rock club operates along the principles of democratic socialism. The first public concerts were marred by numerous incidents, fights, and interruptions. Certain lyrics were judged pornographic and too undignified to be presented in public. From Aquarium to Kino, passing by Alice, Televisor, Unusual Games, Pop Mechanica, and Jungle, rock music turned out to be less easy to control than had been foreseen. Gradually, the passion of the young music enthusiasts began to express itself in broad daylight. There are two approaches used by the groups in the rock club. Those who are really trying to make music, and those who do it because they have nothing else to do. But there are so many things to say about it that they wouldn't fit in this film. <laughs> The group, Secret, is in the process of passing from amateur status to that of professional. The leader is a disc jockey on a Leningrad TV show devoted to the latest records and cassettes. We had the honor of being officially introduced to the only Leningrad group that no one's ever heard of. Why was the group Lyra chosen for us to meet out of the 150 professional and amateur rock groups which are famous for making good music in Leningrad? I don't know why. Undoubtedly because we are a good group. I've been part of it for 20 years. We deserve this success. We are very popular. We have recorded a lot, many interesting pieces. Do you have to be in the Communist Party to be in a professional group here in the Soviet Union? No. And you aren't in the Communist Party? Me? I am a communist, but that doesn't mean anything. There are a lot of guys with us who are not in the party, and they play. Being in the party is not mandatory.
Alexander Sitkovetsky and the group Autograph have just made their breakthrough with the professionals. They were the only Soviet group allowed to play at the World Concert for Ethiopia. Like many other groups, they were formed in 1980 during the most fantastic rock festival ever held in the Soviet Union, the one in Tbilisi, attended by 80,000 people. I'm a freelance journalist and I basically I write about rock music, both Western rock music and, and Soviet rock music. And you have been doing that job for a long time? Uh, well, I did it for quite a long time. Uh, that means that my first article was published in March of 1975, so it was 10 years ago. What are the conditions required? Uh, for a non-professional group to become a professional group? Well, I think that uh, there are two basic conditions. One is that uh, a rock band must have uh, some commercial potential. They uh, must have this uh, ability to sell out the sports palaces, the big concerts hall, and so on. This is essential for the state concert or organizations. And uh, the second condition is that uh, their program, you know, their uh, repertoire, also must satisfy this art Soviet who listen to their music and they decide is it uh, okay for them or is it too subversive. What is he, uh, only professional groups or uh, non-professional groups? Well, here's mostly underground groups and, and some Western uh, new wave and, and rock and roll music. Uh -huh. I, I really, I do not collect the tapes by professional bands. I'm, I'm simply, simply not interested very much in them. So, okay. Well... In this studio apartment, the best equipped in Moscow, a cassette album was produced, Banana Island, which has dominated the hit parade for months. 
was nevertheless a parallel and private production. Andrei Chernevsky, a professional musician, is the Pope of Sound in Moscow. Other studios in Moscow and elsewhere reproduce cassettes of amateur or professionals who have little chance of being produced by Melodia. These cassettes are sold in parallel circuits, which renders the question of royalties for the artists highly hypothetical. <laughs> In just a few years, and despite attempts at repression by the authorities, Rock has little by little set up its own channels, its own small world of specialized journalists, photographers, and groupies. One can even see the appearance of empresarios, who still don't dare admit who they are, and the usual crowd of pretty girls and parasites. A certain Russian-style show business, still a bit stiff, appears during the elegant private evenings of the with it Soviets. The hit parades make their first appearances in the youth press and music reviews. Only the programs and concert calendars are missing. And here's the only Soviet star whose pictures are posted in the streets, Ala Pugachova, the great and only red star who sings the blues as well as rock. What is it like being a star, especially in the Soviet Union? It's the same as it is with you. <laughs> Only with less money. <laughs> Fans camp day and night in front of her house on Gorky Street. Their hope? A single word, a record, an autograph, or a photo. During their vacation, some of them follow her from city to city. In winter, the undaunted don't hesitate at going out in 30 degrees below zero weather. Do you talk to your parents about this kind of music? Yes. My mother, for example, she likes Allah very much. She likes the groups, too. She listens with me. Thank you.